before I attach the antlers to the top of the form uh, for, for fitting to get the proper angle and whatnot, I'd like to do a little explanation about this particular velvet set of antlers. Uh, to preserve it, I used the antler and velvet uh, tan by Knobloch. Okay. Now, the norm, in a normal course of events, um, it explains if the antlers are soft, puncture the tips of the antlers with a large needle, inject antler and velvet tan in vein channels around the base to the tips, and, and clear fluid is visible. If antlers are frozen, thaw out completely before, before applying tan. Paint a heavy coat of antler and velvet tan every, three, every day for three days, hanging after each cycle. Dry up to four hours after tan is applied. Once dry, fluff velvet with a hairdryer, compressed air, or soft brush. Proceed to mount. Okay. These antlers, this animal was taken October 7th. His antlers were already hard. They were already turned to bone. There was no way that there was going to be anything injected into this. And it wasn't really like... Uh, over the course of three days, it was going to do a whole lot. So I opted instead. I painted each side with the antler tan, catching it in a plastic uh, a plastic bin. Um, I hung it up from here off of uh, these clamps and let it drain. I did basically what I did was I coated the antlers three times within several hours, okay, and um, they were saturated, left side, right side, one side at a time. It took a, it took a couple of days to, to do the preservative, and I hung them up for nearly a week to let them fully dry. They were a little sticky in the beginning, but um, what I did was I took a nylon brush, one of these here, and after it was completely dried, brushed out and fluffed the velvet. And that's what I, I'm still doing. Now, there are areas on the antlers where some of the velvet was rubbed off by the deer. Okay, right here. Some of this antler, uh, this antler velvet was actually rubbed off. So, what to do, what to do, what to do? Because I'm involved in model railroading, I have an electric static grass applicator for uh, fiber, uh, I guess it's rayon flocking fiber, and it makes stand-up grass. And it comes in 2 millimeter, uh, like uh, 0 0.5 millimeter, 2 millimeter, 1 millimeter, 6 millimeter, all the way up to 12 millimeter. So what I did was I bought some of the latest offering from... Woodland Scenics Static Grass. Uh, this is Harvest Gold. Now I've not used it on here yet. It appears to have a bit of a goal of a green tinge to it. Uh, so I'm I'm going to order some shades of brown and tan and whatnot and beige. And after the mount is dried and I proceed to finish it, I'm going to cover the head over with uh, plastic or or paper towels, and then I'm going to flock the areas on the antlers. If the color's a little off, I'll just take an airbrush to the entire thing and lightly brush some acrylic color onto it. But um, that's the situation with these antlers. They were really kind of a special case in that they just, they were solid bone already. Now the excess antler velvet and tan chemical, I poured out into one of these little um, iced tea bottles after it was washed out and there's a lot of sediment on the bottom and it was it also became very dirty you don't want to put this back in the bottle it came in this is just kind of dirty so in order to keep the uh, the original bottle clean I store it in a separate bottle but that's the little story with this guy and now I'm going to proceed to Bondo and Excelsior the bottom of the skull plate and fit it to the top of the form I get as close a match as possible to my measurements. All right, I've got my Bondo measured out. Not really measured out, just kind of glumped out onto a disposable 
china paper plate and I'm going to add some of the cream hardener to it I don't want it to set fast so I'm not going to make a hot setting per se okay stir it up with a uh, mix it up with a little craft stick I'm going to get this as thoroughly mixed as possible Fibers got caught now. Oh, don't you just hate when that happens? <laughs> Sometimes it it helps if you use if you double up on your craft sticks. Use two instead of just one. They're really inexpensive enough. It's little wooden craft sticks. Okay, that's a nice shade of pink right there. I'm going to go ahead and spread this out flat. And I'm going to take my little wad of Excelsior and I'm just going to plunk that down in there. Get a glove on my hand. Sometimes it's better to just hand mix it. Yes, I should have had the glove on before I even started. Hopefully it won't start setting up on me. If that happens, I have to mix a new batch. Hopefully it won't. Okay, it's good. This is not too hot. And then you simply mix this all together. You really want to get the Bondo mixed into the Excelsior ball. This is why I put a glove on. Like so. And you want as many fibers trapped in this as possible. You don't want to have a lot of fibers sticking out around the edges. Okay, now I'm going to bring this up to the head form and put it into place. Okay, now I've got the plastic wrapped a little differently than last night. I moved it up just so it's around the eyes. And I'm placing, I'm putting the Bondo Excelsior in place. Let me grab my antlers carefully and gently because they are velvet after all. And I'm going to place this on top like so. Now I need to make sure the back is far enough down and that the set is far enough back. And I think that might be be able to do it right there. I've got to get this. Okay. Now, all righty, I'm going to get under here with the stick and I want to bunch the Excelsior ball up at the front of the antlers so I can raise the front up just a little higher. It's going to be a little higher than the top of the head form, actually, in order to achieve my measurement goal. It's not a ridiculous height, but he does have a high crown of antlers, this little guy does. All right, that one, that side is good. This side is good. Let's just hold it now until this stuff sets. I'm going to hold it in place. Keep the tape measure with me. I'm going to continue to hold this in place until the Bondo kicks off. And anywhere the bone is above the top of the head form, that will be built down with paper mache. All righty, it's been ooh, close to three minutes, I'd say, and the Bondo has pretty well set under the skull. I got as much height as I dare at this point, and I want to make sure that it's even on both sides. Tip this a little bit. Here we go. All right, very nice. Very nice. Okay, I like the way that looks. Let me look at it from the side. Okay, very good. Very, very, very good. Very good indeed. Yeah, that's nice. 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put the screws through so that it, it will dry without me having to hold it. The holes were pre-drilled through the skull plate and on into the head block of the form. So I could get in with screwing this in by hand. I'd really rather not use an electric drill anywhere near this velvet. So this is a little, yeah, I've been saying old school. This is old school, baby. This is, this is, this is Flintstones rock old school. Uh, my goodness, this is really tiring, but I don't want to run the risk of the drill skipping off the screw top and taking off a swath of velvet because that would mean that it would take it clean down to the bone and I don't want anything ruining this velvet that I fought so hard to preserve and keep in place. Now, let me check my measurements. Uh, he's tilted all the way over. Oh, there we go. I bet that looks better on camera, too. Sure enough. Oh, yes, very nice. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right. That's as close to his original measurements as I'm going to get without raising him and jacking it way the hell up higher. As you can see here, right now, he's up pretty high over the top of the form. And I don't want it getting any higher than this, really. I don't want it coming much higher than this. Now I'm going to go ahead and put the screws in the front and I'm going to walk away and let it set for a while and then I'll come back take the antlers off and we'll work on the nose and apply the cape okay before doing anything else uh, with the cape or whatnot I need to mache over the top of the skull plate these are down tight, but they're not all the way down for a specific reason. The reason is I build the mache around the base and I need to keep the screws elevated so that they don't get trapped beneath the mache. In the meantime, what I'm doing now, I'm pulling the plastic down forward just a bit so that the mache that needs to come onto the forehead of the head form, okay, ahead of the uh, where the antlers are sitting, I can bring some mache down and blend it to the top of the form without letting the eyes dry out any further. So some T-pins strategically placed will keep the plastic where I want it and yet still keep the eyes wrapped and fresh and lovely. All right, I've got everything I need to mache the top of the skull plate for the antlers. I like to use the Sally Dames mache. I think this is a uh, this is a uh, plaster base mache. There's a uh, yellow dextrin and uh, extender in there, paper pulp. Just plain water. Yeah, it's in an old vinegar bottle, but it's just plain water. Rubber flex bowl. And to stir it, my little old butter knife. A little bit of water in the bowl. Because uh, the Sally Davis Mache is a plaster-based product, it's best to add the dry mix to the water, the same way you mix plaster. You never want to put dry plaster in a bowl and pour water into it. As always, pour plaster into the water. So the Sally Dames Mache will go into the water. <clears throat> I have a little aluminum scoop I keep in the bag. And like so. And unlike plaster, because this has the other ingredients in it, 
I don't wait until the dry material soaks up the water. I just start mixing it right away. And I'll be needing to add more plaster. I just make, made, used a little too much water. So I'll add some more plaster. I like it on the thick side. Now, if you really want to slow this kind of plaster down, you can add a touch of white vinegar. That's not what's in that bottle. <laughs> it's just plain water. Vinegar will slow down the setting time. A little brine water, a little salt water, will speed it up. And I don't want it to speed up. I like it thick like this. This is a good thickness right here. It allows me to place it and sculpt it around the antler base where I want. Now, let's get to the deer. Okay. I'm going to start the application just behind the antler burr. And I want to try like hell not to get any mache on the velvet. You know, any anything you can do to keep from having to brush against the velvet, even though it's preserved, even though it's been on here for a while and you've been brushing it, anything you can do to avoid getting any schmutz in the velvet that requires like hard brushing out, you want to try and avoid that. So I want to be real extra careful, I'm a little more careful than I am around regular antlers. Regular antlers, you get, you get some of the mache on it, you wipe it down, you wet it, you wipe it away. No big deal. But here, you want to be real careful. Like so. <clears throat> now, I want to press down into the gap between the bone and the head form. I want to fill that gap with mache. I want to lock the mache to where the Bondo and Excelsior underlayer is located. I want to fill right down into right down into that. Let me get around this thing. Pardon, pardon, pardon. Pardon moi. Hey, French again, baby. Woohoo! Okay, going along here, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to extend the mache down onto the forehead, and I'm going to shape kind of a new forehead to the form. Not kind of a new forehead, I'm going to shape a new forehead to the form. That would be kind of like a certain orange dum-dum saying, I'm like a genius! Isn't you know, that the way he brags about himself? It sounds more like the things his parents told him when he was a kid. Son, you're like a genius! The stupid son of a bitch grew up and believed it. No, I don't like the moron. And I don't care who knows it. Now, come around. I want to make sure this gets a nice rounded shape at the back. Even though it has partial ear butts sculpted into it, this is one of Matuska's competitive, uh, competitor's choice white tailed deer mannequins. Very nice mannequins. Great detail. They fit the skins great, too. I mean, I have had to do very little altering on these forms to get them to fit proper. 
beautifully proportioned. Beautiful look of a white tail. No overbuilding of the muscle. No goiter on the neck, on the turns. I've used full sneaks, semi sneaks. <clears throat> I've used the high uprights. These are the semi uprights, which makes it more or less a relaxed upright. And I'm getting in behind the antlers right up to the bone. I make sure it goes right up to the bone. I'll see if I can't show that when I'm finished modeling this all around the skull plate. One thing I want to do here, get between the front and rear screws. I don't want a lot of mache up there because there's not a lot of meat to the top of the skull. Not a lot of flesh up there. There's just a coating. So you don't need a whole lot. But you do want to make sure that you come right up to the antler burrs. And yes, there is mache going into the tops of the screw holes. That will be modeled out. As I go along, you will see. Let's get this flattened out here some. Join the front to the back. As far as the mache goes, I don't. I don't want a large gap back here. I don't. I don't want to have to use critically as a filler back here. So I get my mache right up tight. Works to wipe the mache off the blade of the knife or whatever tool you're using so that you can get in here and model and get in close. Now, it's just a little loose, so it's a little floppy, a little wobbly. And I'm going to keep going. Okay, I've got it all the way around. All around the skull plate, the butter knife chased the mache. The mache thought was all in fun. Goes the mache. You gotta keep your sense of humor. It's critical. Pardon, pardon. There's that French guy again. <clears throat> now I'm gonna take it down the forehead onto the top of the head form. I'm going to blend this down, like so. Now, in order to get around these T-pins with the butter knife, I'm going to wet my finger, simply, and I really am left-handed. <laughs> yeah, let's turn this around this way, like so. I'm just going to wet my finger down and shape it with my fingers. So I'm going to get a little more right up to the bottom of the antler burr. Like so. There's no shortcuts. You really you want the work done right. There really are no shortcuts to be taken here. I'm going to make sure it's even on both sides. On both sides of the antler two head form juncture. Make sure it's an even amount of mache on each side. I called it plaster before. I, I meant mache. Well, that's because I engaged my mouth before thinking. Let's get a little squirt bottle and start shaping. Okay, 
I filled my little atomizer bottle with water. Put a little squirt of water on my finger. And I start by simply patting the mache where I want it to be. Okay, like so. Alrighty then. Right, now, to get this properly shaped, I've got a uh, little disposable acid brush, which I don't really dispose of them, I just kind of wash them out after each use. But I'm going to get in here with this brush and I'm going to model this down with the wet brush like so. And I'm going to come up, bring this up just like so and around. This will get in more neatly around the antler burrs than the butter knife or any modeling tool would. And a lot neater than even my finger. Finger. Go all the way around. Like so. Up we go. Using the brush to shape is real similar to when I was using the brush to shape the um, oh, bouncy bouncy when I was using the brush to shape the clay around the eyes it's very much the same effect same use make sure, just make sure you keep your brush very very wet and I'm doing what I said I didn't want to do so I may have to do a little bit of brushing off the velvet anyway. I'll get it off while it's wet. That'll make it a bit easier. There we go. Around we go. Across the top. We want to even this out as well. We don't want, you know, a high rise or lump on one side and not on the other. The only high point on the skull plate should be down the center where the natural ridge of the skull plate is to be found. And if that means taking some mache away with a brush or the tool, then so be it. But you want this to be even. You don't want it to be flat without any character, but you want it to be symmetrical. Whether the, deer, whether the deer's skull was symmetrical in life or not, it's going to look better on the client's wall if it is symmetrical. That means eyes correctly placed, moderate amount of clay equally sculpted around the eyes. Now from here I can see that the back portion of the head right here, which you can't see where, you're, where the camera is sitting, needs just a touch more mache. So I'm going to pull some up out of the little container, place it where it's needed, shape it, with the butter knife blade, and now refine it with the wet brush. Yeah, I really don't like making things disposable. I prefer reusing them over and over and over again. Here we go. Like so. Now you see how it's beginning to droop a little bit here? We simply wet the brush just a touch. Careful, 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 and we lift the mache up as we go. Get that errant brush hair out of there. Okay, and we come around. Run the mache to the head. Remove some mache from the head form. 
Now I come to my little fun part. Some people ask, well now how the heck do you get that thing off of there? Well, funny, you should ask. In fact, it's hysterical. I take a large scalpel blade. I'm not sure what number this is, it really doesn't matter. I spray it with the water. It's just plain water. Wet the blade and I cut along the bottom where the mache meets the top of the head form. I slice right in. Wipe off the excess on my apron. Wet the blade again. I know it ends here which means I start my upright like so. Now I am going to be separating the mache along the line of the skull plate where it meets the mache that's been sculpted to the head. Again, clean off the blade, a little bit of water, go around to the other side, wipe it off again, wet it again, now we go along the side of the mache where it meets the top of the head form all the way around the back. Repeat the same move on this side. Now on this one because it goes so far down I'll go back over it again just as it's beginning to set up. But I go like so here around the back of the mache work. I'm basically creating relief cut all the way around. Young Frankenstein's creature had a zipper neck. This just has a little slot head. Again, I go way down, go as deep down as I can. I go over it several times because I want to make sure nothing is going to adhere. The worst thing, and I've done it, I've done it so I, I know what I'm about to say. The worst thing you could do is to let this dry, is to let this fully set without that separation and then try to take it off without breaking it. Then after it's broke, picking up the little tiny pieces and gluing them back in place. That's a pain in the ass. Plain and simple. Royal pain in the ass. So I want to make sure as this product sets up, and it does set up wonderfully, I want to make sure it will come away from itself. Like so. And that's a good separation right there. I've used WD-40 oil on the blade and that doesn't make it come away any better. I can tell you right now. That doesn't do anything. Water is the best thing to cut through the mache with. It's a water-based mache. Water is the best thing. You can see how nice that's pulling away from itself right there. That's what you want. You want it to pull away from itself. And I go over it several times. I don't, I don't really have a count of how many times I go over it. Wipe off the excess water a bit. You don't want to saturate it, but you do want it to come away. Like so. Okay, now. Simply smooth the edges. Make sure we have a, fine, a full fledged separation between top, 
cut and the sides, which we do. That's nice. Now this will be allowed to fully set and dry. Don't forget, the eyes under the plastic, they're fine. Now right here, I'm going to pull the plastic forward a little, expose some of that clay, but I'm going to just simply smooth the mache onto the top of the head form, then bring the plastic back. Again from Young Frankenstein. We're putting the plastic back. Paraphrasing it anyway. Now the nice thing about having the hide paste on the clay around the eyes and then having them under plastic is quite frankly it allows the clay to still have some uh, malleability to it. You can still shape the clay. You can really refine it. Okay, you can really refine it. That's what I love about this method. This is an old method. It's been brought back to the forefront. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I went with the I tuck method for years. I hated how many times I had to go back and repair my clay work. I hated it. But it's one of those things, you know, you, you, you tried the new method and it, you get into using it and then you're in kind of the new method rut. Nothing against the new method tannery, I, I don't mean that. Now, any gap that forms, like this is pretty wide, doesn't matter. Once this is secured back in place, it's a very simple matter to just clean that up and add a little clay. Now, I'm simply washing off the knife blade with some spray water. And I'm going to go here now, and I'm going to carve around the openings for the screws before this mache sets. There are several ways to open up around the bottom of the screws to open the holes to get the heads of the screws down. You can use a cartilage knife. I can use my favorite little modeling tool. I usually use this end right here. Or you can use a larger modeling tool like so. Let's see what I'm going to use. Oh, surprise, surprise, I think I'm going to use my favorite little modeling tool. And what i got to do is cut down into the mache. And you could feel when you've reached the hole. All right. The holes for the screw heads have been countersunk into the bone. Now you could feel those holes opening up and exposing. Get rid of that. Like so. And I work around them. Get this out of there. And get the mache out of the hole. That's one. I'm going to repeat this for all the other screws. It's the same process. So here we have it, the two openings for the screws in front, as well as the openings for the screws at the back. Now, for those of you who are real diehard old schoolers who still like the full, full length open incision, this is unnecessary. If you were using a full incision, you would screw down, your, you would Tighten down your screws all the way and completely cover over the top of the skull plate with mache or your choice of whatever, clay, plaster, what have you. Um, for those of us who 
really enjoy using the short incision as I do, um, what will be done, especially after that, this is why the, the slots were cut to loosen the front and the sides and the back of the skull plate. When this mache is fully cured, okay, the screws will be taken all the way out, at least until so that the entire skull plate could be popped off the top, all right? And the whole thing will be lifted off, the cape pulled on, well, the paste applied, the cape pulled on, and then this will be reapplied, and it'll all line up. If nothing breaks, it'll, it should line up beautifully, if nothing breaks. And of course, you do get them unbreaking at times. You do get no breakage at times. I'm going to go in and I'm loosening this up even more. It's really, really set now. Now it's not set enough to come off. Not quite yet, no. No, 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 no. Is it ready? No, 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 no. It's got a little more to set. As you can see as I went by with the, uh, the front of the scalpel blade just pushed into the mache here. And that's okay. That's okay. And here, you can see how far up behind the burr of the antlers I come with my mache. Okay? Right up to the very back of the antler burrs. Now here, at the back of the skull, at the back of the mache, I should say, around the rear edge of the skull, where the slot has been created, you can see this corner start of the ear butt right here this is going to be taken away I'm going to get in there I'm going to just file that away a little bit probably with my small wood rasp and uh, my double wood rasp wood file but I'm going to take that corner off right on down the line I want it more round than it appears at this point. Now I'm simply going to let the mache fully cure. You can tell right now it hasn't even started to heat yet. It has not gone through its heating cycle. I'm going to let it cure, whatever it takes, an hour or two. I'll grab some coffee and uh, I'll come back to it later and we'll get cracking on the mountain once again. All right, I'm going to try a little something different on this guy. Because this is so deep right here, I want to make sure that my scalpel was able to get through. And it, this is very deep. So, I'm going to take a Stanley dovetail saw. You can also use a miter saw. And I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that this cut from the scalpel blade goes all the way down. I'm just drawing it back. I'm just drawing it back at this point. Okay. I want to make sure I go all the way down. Now the, the mache is not quite set fully. The surface is dried, but deep down where this is thickest, it's still pretty wet. So I'm going to go through with the saw, I know I'm going to have to come on this side to do this here. I'm going to go ahead and finish this up. And when we come back, I'll know if it's going to work or not. Fingers crossed, kids. Well, I've gone all the way around. All the way around the top, all the way around the sides, and around the back. And uh, after every so many swipes, I needed to clean the mache out of the blade. So I would take a card file. This is the little gizmo you use for cleaning files. And these little wire bristles here clean all the gook out of the saw teeth. Just the way they clean all the gook out of a file. Okay. 
Just gonna undo the screws. Did you swallow a mouse? He's saying no, no. Or yes, yes. Maybe I just don't understand mouse. I don't know. Again, I don't want to use a power drill around this velvet, so this takes a little while. All right, well, let's see what we've got here. Is it loose? Yeah, well, the front is loose. And maybe we'll unscrew the back screws just a little more. They need to come a little higher because there's less mass of bone and bondo material at the back. Well, let's see how this lifts off and very very gently. Got my hands against the side of the head form and I'm pushing up and wonderful wonderful it's wonderful wonderful okay now where I was cutting through before uh, it did not come away but the entire rear section lift it off. So now when I lay it down, I have to make sure I lay it down so that the back is not touching anything. The front's still pretty moist. All right, so now that I know that this is, is successful, I will reset this. And tighten the screws just a couple of turns. Nothing big, just a couple of turns. Especially at the back. And I just roll the handle of the screwdriver between my paws. Like so. Like this. There we go. Get this one. Not too concerned about getting the front screws back into the holes. I want to make sure the rear will hold. That's that's the main part. So then when the screwdriver slips off, it just slips off. But if if an, if a power drill a screwdriver slips off, it could you know zip, strip all that velvet away, and that's a bozo no no. That would be a bozo no-no. Now I'm just going to leave this. I'm going to let it finish. I'm going to let it complete its, its setting time. <clears throat> because the stuff deep down is really, really wet. So I'm just going to attach the plastic to the front screws so it can hold everything back in place like so and there we are everything else is held tight and it's all good and when I come back to mount the head I'm not going to have any problem this is what I did pulled plastic up around the face Secured it tightly to the front screws. Now I'll simply take this and I may just, well, seeing as how this is the ends of the, bo of the uh, bag, I may just put a couple of pins. You don't want to ever put a pin like in the bottom of a bag, but around the around the top edge like this not really a problem I just want to hold it snug against the form keep out the air until I get back to mount this deer there we go there we go